so today's lecture is going to be about a nanocrystalline steel and by nanocrystalline I don't mean that there will be some particles in the material which are tiny but you have a huge density of interfaces in the material okay so you know uh, I'll talk about numbers like 100 million square meters of interface per meter cubed so that's a, a huge amount of interface now supposing uh, after all these lectures okay you have to design uh, a bulk nanocrystalline steel which is very strong tough and cheap okay so the first thing you need to define is what do you mean by very strong what do you mean by uh, tough cheap and nanocrystalline so the first uh, thing is uh, easy to answer you know if you are talking to a person who works on amorphous metals they'll talk about a centimeter cubed as being bulk but what we are interested is in making huge objects all right so you can see that truck and there's a human being next to the tire over there and by nanocrystalline I mean something that is going to be on the scale of a carbon nanotube because everyone knows uh, about carbon nanotubes right and how cheap do you think this material has to be so that we can make very large objects any ideas yeah so we've got a bottle of water there right yeah and uh, that costs 50p I believe uh, and you know it's perfectly okay to drink tap water and yet we are happy to transport it in a plastic bottle from Scotland or somewhere so if we can uh, make it the same sort of price as bottled water weight for weight or volume by volume then we can afford to make uh, big objects okay so um, that's the sort of cost that we want uh, if we are able to use it on a very large scale okay uh, obviously we'll talk about uh, very large numbers because uh, strong materials etc and just to remind you what a pascal feels like if you take an apple then the weight of an apple is about a newton and if you put it on a square meter that's one pascal so even when you're talking about a hundred megapascals that's a hundred million apples on one square meter okay so you know you would say a hundred megapascals is not particularly strong right but it's incredible actually and you know you can explain it to all your friends in the humanities that one pascal and a hundred megapascals is a hundred million apple on one square meter okay we'll be talking about billions of apples on one square meter um, now back in 1956 we could make uh, iron which is of the order of 14 gigapascals strong okay 14,000 megapascals strong uh, and the way you do it is it's a single crystal and it's tiny so the probability of finding defects is very low and therefore the strength is uh, approaching its ideal strength which is about 21 gigapascals okay but you can see that as we scale that up the strength collapses to normal levels uh, and the reason is of course you know uh, defects will arise dislocations etc and therefore um, when we start from something that's perfect and we scale it up you're likely to lose strength uh, which means uh, basically that uh, we can't rely on perfection to get strength the the second possibility is that we introduce so many defects that they basically become less mobile and therefore the strength goes up so this is a, a steel wire which is available commercially it has a strength of 5.5 gigapascals and it's made by taking um, a true strain of 9 but just to explain to you what a true strain of 9 means if you take 50 grams of iron and you stretch it out into 2 kilometers that's a strain of 9 okay so there's severe deformation here and yet you know you can tie a knot with it which means it has ductility and you can even see the reduction of area when you break it okay so uh, this relies on uh, very very fine 
structure produced by severe deformation. This is an atom probe image. The dots represent atoms. If you squint your eyes, you can see some dark lines here, okay, which are the dislocation cell boundaries, basically. So, you know, you made incredibly fine dislocation cells, and therefore you've got a very high strength. And um, you can make it on a large scale. However, anything that you make by deformation will have limited shapes. So you'll have wires, or you'll have very thin sheets, etc. And just to show you how thin this is, uh, sorry, first of all, you can see that uh, the strength is not sensitive to size in this case. So this was the previous graph that I showed where we went from a strength of something like 14 gigapascals down to normal strength when we scaled up the size of the single crystals. And this is drawn wire which is insensitive to. So there's an advantage in producing strength by deformation is that it's insensitive to size. But this is the sort of size that you end up with for that wire. So there's a very strange unit of thread, right, which is a denier which is the weight of uh, um, weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber, right? So don't ask me how you come up with such a unit, but it exists. And men's socks are about 50 denier, and women's stockings are about 10 denier. And this particular steel wire is finer than the thread in women's stockings, okay? So it has its uses, for example, for cutting semiconductors. You know, you don't waste a lot of material. But clearly, you're not going to be able to make uh, large components out of it, OK? OK, so uh, then we come on to um, carbon nanotubes, which you know, has had a lot of publicity in the past uh, 20 years or so. And it started with this, that the strength is 130 gigapascals. Okay. And the modulus along its length is 1.2 terapascals. That's six times that of steel. So you could see headlines in the newspapers, you know, that engineers are salivating uh, at carbon nanotubes which will replace steel. Okay? So what they've done, uh, and you can see that this is in a journal called Acta Astronautica, because, you know, lots of money was being spent on seeing whether we could build space elevators, etc using this. And of course, what was forgotten was elementary. This is the stuff you did in part 1a when you were looking at uh, diffusion. So when you create a defect inside a material, uh, there will be a cost which will oppose the formation of a defect. But at the same time, you increase the number of configurations. And that uh, it results in a reduction in free energy. So these two terms balance out and you get an equilibrium number of defects. So if you look at the strength of a carbon nanotube, it collapses, just like the strength of perfect iron. Okay? Nothing at all new in this. When you increase the number of entities in your object, you will get a larger number of defects. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's a thermodynamic principle. So these are equilibrium densities of defects. So there is no uh, carbon nanotube bigger than two millimeter, which beats the strength of steel. Okay? Uh, it's complete nonsense to talk about uh, using 130 gigapascals. And exactly the same applies to graphene. Okay? Uh, graphene, not by coincidence, has a strength of 130 gigapascals, because it's just carbon-carbon bonds, right? And you know, if you wrap up graphene, that's a nanotube. So that strength is measured on minute samples of graphene. As Soon as you scale it up, you lose all that strength. So just to summarize so far, strength that is produced by deformation is limited in its shape. And you know, if you rely on perfection, it's doomed as the size increases. Okay? So this is not going to be the method by which you can produce uh, a bulk nanostructured material which is strong and so forth. This uh, uh, process where we look at the refinement of grains is a beautiful process because you know you increase the strength and you increase the toughness. Okay? Um, but there is a cost to creating grain boundaries. 
uh, that is the surface uh, energy per unit area multiplied by the amount of surface that you have in a unit volume just like we did it for perlite you know this is the surface per unit volume and this is the interfacial energy uh, so that is the cost where L bar is the grain size cost of creating interfaces so if you balance that against what leads to the creation of the grains then you can get a theory for the finest possible grain size that you can obtain for a given driving force okay so here is that graph where we basically have a, an undercooling below an equilibrium temperature which is producing ferrite and that gives you the uh, energy to produce surfaces you balance that and you get that pinkish curve and what that indicates is that you know it should be possible to get to even uh, 0.01 of a micrometer in size but when you look at uh, the steels that are produced and huge amounts of money have been spent on trying to get the grain size fine we are stuck at approximately one micrometer okay and the reason is when you are producing a large quantity rapidly uh, the heat of transformation basically warms up the steel okay so you get a, something called recalescence what that does it is reduces the undercooling so when you take account of that uh, recalescence you're not going to get much below one micrometer by thermomechanical processing okay so it's a fantastic process it produces you know hundreds of millions of tons of steel every year but it's not going to get you down to less than roughly one micrometer so you need a mechanism of dissipating the heat or of storing the heat inside the material in the form of uh, strain energy okay so thermomechanical processing is limited by recalescence and just by these first few slides we've come up uh, with some principles that to produce a bulk nanocrystalline steel we need to store the heat of transformation if we reduce the rate of transformation then that helps because uh, heat has time to diffuse out of the material and it's always a good thing to transform at a low temperature because you know there's a large driving force and you will get a greater nucleation rate etc okay now this is not sufficient though because work done on producing nanocrystalline materials shows that the ductility collapses as you uh, reduce the grain size so this this applies to steel but it's absolutely the same behavior for aluminum or any other material that plastic instability comes in almost instantly if your grain size is very small and the reason for this is that when you have very fine grains there's a lot of grain boundary area per unit volume and the distance between grain boundaries becomes smaller so dislocations basically sink into the boundaries and then there is no mechanism for work hardening okay so you can see that as soon as we get the slightest bit of plastic deformation uh, you've got a plastic instability so how can we solve this what other mechanism of work hardening do you know of transformation induced plasticity also, that's one possibility but in our conditions we need to introduce that as well that there must be a mechanism of introducing work hardening everyone happy so far so we are going to try and produce uh, very fine crystals by phase transformation rather than by deformation or perfection okay now we need to store the heat of transformation so to reduce the enthalpy change of transformation if we have a product which comes about by displacive transformation then you're storing a huge amount of elastic strain energy yeah that's not released you know of the order of uh, few hundred joules per mole which is quite a large quantity okay okay so you've seen this slide before this is the displacement caused by the bainite transformation 
and because we need uh, the retained austenite to introduce work hardening capacity, we are going to work on the bainite transformation and see whether we can produce uh, the transformation product with very, very little plates. And this is the mechanism by which bainite forms. It forms like martensite, but the carbon partitions and it stabilizes austenite. So it's the cheapest form of austenite that you can get by using carbon as the stabilizer. Okay, so this is obviously not nanocrystalline. You can see the scale there. What we've got to do is take that structure and make the plates finer than carbon nanotubes. Okay, so transforming at a low temperature We'll do that. Uh, what is the lowest temperature at which you can get bainite? In your experience, what is the lowest temperature at which you can get bainite? Sorry? Martin side start. So, but I can suppress the Martin side start temperature. So it, just in, your, in, in everything you've learned, just give me some numbers. What's the lowest temperature at which you get, get bainite? 200 degrees, C. 200 degrees C, but you know, it's a fundamental question. Could I get it at uh, zero Kelvin? Yeah. So let, let's just uh, do the calculations. All the theory is there. All I've got to do is make sure that both the martensite start and the bainite start temperatures are suppressed together. All right. Uh, so these are just some calculations where the dash line is room temperature. All right. Uh, and uh, you know, basically that says I could get bainite at room temperature. Okay. Is there any catch in this? Does it depend on the diffusion rate of the carbon? Yeah, so this, this is just pure thermodynamics. How does kinetics come into it? Well, you know, if I actually make a steel which will transform at room temperature, it will take about 100 years for the bainite to form. <coughs> and you know when I, uh, so that's about 1.5 weight percent carbon, it would take 100 years. Now of course you know good wine is stored for 100 years and then sold for lots of money. Yeah. So I tried to explain to the steel companies that they could do this but they were not convinced. Okay. <laughs> so we'll go for a more practical solution which is about 1 weight percent carbon and it will take about 10 days and a transformation temperature of around 200 degrees centigrade. Okay, so a very, very simple um, composition. You have 1 weight percent of carbon. Uh, silicon, you all know what it's there for, is to suppress the cementite formation. And the manganese and chromium are there to avoid high temperature transformations. The molybdenum is there for a special reason that when you make large quantities of steel, it's not feasible or it's not affordable to remove impurities like phosphorus. Okay? Uh, and phosphorus is very bad for steel because it segregates to the austenite grain boundaries and embrittles them. If we add molybdenum, then it gathers the phosphorus atoms and stops them from doing the harm. Okay? So the reason for adding molybdenum is to stop uh, embrittlement of the austenite grain boundaries. Okay, and the heat treatment is simple. You austenitize and then you transform to bainite. And this is the structure that you get. All right? So the scale there is 40 micrometers. So this is an optical micrograph. And you know, you've seen bainite before. It doesn't look terribly different, right? But the point is you should examine at a range of magnifications because this shows that the properties will be isotropic. Okay? Now, the next slide that I show you will be a transmission electron micrograph. It's absolutely breathtaking. So are you prepared for this? Okay, take a deep breath. Uh, and when we look at this, so remember TEM is very, very high magnification. So we're looking at a very tiny region of the sample. Uh, there's a carbon nanotube at the same magnification on the top uh, right hand. And these are your incredibly fine platelets of bainitic ferrite with the carbon enriched retained austenite in between. And you can see that they are about 20 nanometers in width. Okay? So 
when you have a plate shaped, the mean free slip distance is roughly twice that thickness. So you've effectively got a grain size which is less than 40 nanometers. Right? So if you work out the amount of interface you have per unit volume, that's 100 million square meters per cubic meter, an incredible amount of interfacial area. And those interfaces are between austenite and ferrite. In other words, they are strong interfaces. They pose formidable barriers to dislocation motion. When you test the properties of this material, uh, you know, you've got quite a lot of ductility there and strength approaching two and a half gigapascals. Now, the diffusion distance at that temperature for 10 days is ridiculously small. It's 10 to the minus 17 meters, all right, for iron atoms. But that's uh, not a surprise because, uh, you know, we can still get transformation because it's a displacive transformation, all right? Uh, carbon can happily diffuse at that temperature. Uh, so we've got a very fine uh, structure and, you know, because of the very large density of interfaces, the hardness is very high. It's about 700 vickers of hardness. And uh, again, it's designed using very, very simple theory, okay? Now, just to show you some examples, uh, this was an experiment done in the Cavendish where you measure the uh, strength as a function of very high velocity impacts. Okay? Uh, if you deviate from the straight line, that means you've got some plasticity. So, at very high strain rates, you've got a strength of 10 gigapascals. Right? So, can you think of an application? Yeah? armor. Yeah? This has been fired at many times. You've got to pass it around and feel the weight. Okay? Um, so, it can take multiple shots. All right? And this is a, a thicker version for vehicles. Right? Now, I'll explain to you what the holes are there for. Uh, you can produce it on mass. So, this is the actual armor steel being produced. Those coils of thick uh, plate are this bulk nanocrystalline steel. And this is uh, armor which has been fired on with quite uh, terrifying projectiles. And you can see that it survives. Now, the reason for the holes is that the holes have got sharp edges. Okay? So, you know, the projectiles will be damaged, deflected, fragmented, just by having those edges around. So, the way you measure the efficiency of an armor is uh, ballistic mass efficiency. Uh, so, the one on the left is normal armor. Then you have the titanium alumina. Alumina can only take a shot. And this is the new armor. Now, the ballistic mass efficiency is 2 if we don't have any holes. It becomes 3 if we have holes. All right? So, supposing, uh, so that's with about 50% holes. So, supposing that we put 100% holes, then it should become 4 and it will become stealth armor. Okay? Um, I'll just show you uh, a movie of um, actual projectiles being fired at this. Uh, and you can see that uh, the material is not, frag the armor itself is not uh, catastrophically fragmented, but the projectile becomes destroyed in the process. And there will be a sort of a cartoon uh, variety of this uh, shortly, which shows what actually happens. So behind this armor is a normal mild steel backing plate, which will contain the debris. Yeah, so this is, this is uh, what actually happens when you fire at this thing. And you can see that backing plate is necessary to contain the debris, but it's not particularly an armor steel. Okay? So it's a, it's a system of armor. Now, the second uh, application is shafts for aircraft engines. This is not yet actually in aircraft engines because it, it takes a long time for these things to happen. But you can see the size of the aircraft engine. It's huge compared with the lorry. 
and the engine shaft here is made from steel and the reason why this is uh, very large is because most of the air actually doesn't go through the engine it provides the thrust um, the the fan fan blades are driven by everything that's going on in this hot hot stage and the shaft has to transmit all that torque from the power generation to the fan blades furthermore if a fan blade breaks then the engine will vibrate violently right uh, and that can bring the aircraft down so the shaft has to be able to bend temporarily plastic bending in order to accommodate temporarily the imbalance okay so it's very severe requirements and for future engines we require new materials for the shaft so we are trying a variety of things but one of them is this uh, nanocrystalline bainite and you can see here the shaft material the the these are the nanocrystalline bainite and being heat treated here in Germany so this is the oxidizing treatment take it out and you put it into a salt bath at 200 degrees centigrade and you then remove it and put it into an oven at 200 because it's, you don't want to leave it too long inside the salt bath okay <coughs> but there's a lot of work to be done before this can actually fly so here's our nanocrystalline material and uh, it's very strong and has huge uniform ductility uh, there's no deformation required to produce this no rapid cooling and no uh, so one of the problems when you cool things rapidly is that the temperature will not be uniform through the section and then you will get some distortion especially if it's a complex component you know if you have key waves and things like that then you will get distortion and uh, it's cheap you saw in the alloying elements there's nothing particularly expensive and you know heat treating at 200 degrees centigrade for 10 days is like a pizza oven yeah uh, obviously 10 days is longer than a pizza <laughs> heat treatment but it's not expensive uh, so um, questions all right um, can you tell me problems with this uh, I mean the sort of uh, applications that I've mentioned is the armor, the shaft, and also we've got a large team working on bearings. Yeah. Why are we limiting? Why hasn't this changed life as we know it? All right. Quite heavy. Uh, it's you know it's not a different density from the 1.4 billion tons of steels produced, and most. You know, even though you are fed all the time that you need to make light materials, the vast majority of applications are terrestrial. Yeah. So, tell me what the problems are with this material. Can't weld. Can't weld. Who said that? Yeah. Okay. Any others? Um, so I need you to answer. I'll tell you why. Tell me some problem with this material. No problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's not uh, particularly tough. Yeah. yeah, it is. It has toughness, but it's not remarkably tough. All right. So we we haven't looked at hydrogen embrittlement, but it would, you know, if you make something very strong, it would suffer from that, right? And there are many other problems. Uh, now, uh, that is a, a that is a tie with the bulk nanocrystalline structure printed on it. Okay and uh, the reason why I was saying you need to answer is because this is a scarf but you can have it anyway <laughs> okay okay right so um, you can see that if you try to weld it it will crack crack in front of your eyes okay that means you rule it out of the vast majority of structural applications uh, so what we need to do next is as follows uh, we've had a project for four years on designing a steel with an impossible combination of properties right uh, and that means we need the same sort of strength level as here we need 30 percent of ductility and also ductility at high strain rate but look at this you know we need to have uh, choppy impact energy at minus 40 degrees centigrade 
this, this stuff that I've just passed around has five joules at room temperature, okay? So, so this would not work. Um, and it's really tricky. It has to be weldable, cheap, large in all dimensions, mass production, and high temperature. High temperature capability is not so important. But these were the conditions that were set, okay? Now, I'm not going to have time to go into this, but I'll show you um, why we want this combination of properties. That we want an armor which can be welded. Now, if you can weld it, then you can make vehicles out of it. You don't need to hang the armor on, and therefore you reduce the weight, right? The second thing is that you know the threat isn't just from ballistic projectiles, right? Uh, if you have a blast, then that's like a sudden distributed load, right? And for that, you need uh, considerable toughness as well. So we have created a, a, a new material. Um, and this is a test being done in our engineering department, because we are obviously not uh, going to use explosives. Right? So what you do instead is you fire aluminum foam at high velocity onto the steel. And the point is that you look at the amount of deflection that mustn't be very large, and of course, it mustn't develop cracks when, when you do that. So that's the aluminum foam being fired at uh, you know, 445 meters per second. And of course, this is not the proper test, all right? The proper test is to put uh, explosives at a distance from the plate, and then it would bulge. But those tests have not yet been done. Uh, the material is ready, but uh, the test will be done by the MOD. So the deflection is important because you know if there are people inside, you do not want it to bulge too much. All right? And furthermore, it mustn't fail, uh, fail uh, below, below the bulge. All right? Otherwise, you will put debris inside the compartment. OK, so. Um, we're not there yet, all right? We, we need to validate all the work that has been done on 100 kilogram samples on many, many tons. The many tons of material has been produced and is awaiting tests at the MOD. Now, I said to you that, look, um, uh, if I wanted to produce bainite at room temperature, then it would take 100 years, all right? So we made that alloy. and. This is the material. It's uh, in a sealed quartz tube, polished sample, so that if transformation happens, you'll see surface relief, and in an inert atmosphere in the Science Museum. Right? And the experiment started in 2004 and will be finished in 2104. So in universities, we do long-term research. Okay? So, you know, you, you have to tell this story to your children and your grandchildren to verify <laughs> that this will happen. I hope that it doesn't happen before 2104, because then that would indicate the theory is not correct. Okay? So, that's the end of the lectures, and uh, we've still got an examples class to come. Okay? So, thank you.